All right, uh, so yesterday at around approximately 1.30 in the afternoon, uh, the uh, detainee here from YSC uh, escaped. Um, I'll get into the protocol a, a little bit there. The question will be, why such a delay? I was notified at 5.37 p.m. in the evening, um, and I'll answer some of those questions right away. One of the problems that we are seeing right away is protocol within staff. That is too long of a delay for us to make sure that we um, are able to get somebody back in custody who is a, a danger to the community. Um, between that also, we are looking into why BCSO was not notified immediately other than we respond to the county facility. We do know that 911 was called. We do know that the Albuquerque Police Department did arrive and did an attempt to locate in the area. And we also know that he was entered as missing and endangered. That is a huge question for me as the sheriff on why it was entered into NCIC that way. Um, we had basically an escaped convict who was convicted of murder and was awaiting sentencing on June 26. Uh, once I was notified at 537, we immediately activated our detective teams and my command staff and they arrived here at 615 and started to get the facts before we put anything out to the media. Uh, between that time, we made sure we did a head count of the rest of the facility and the people in the pod and everybody else here to make sure that we didn't have any other absconders, to make sure we didn't need to get the information out to you and public because that is what we need to do and make sure that we get a public safety announcement out. Uh, by that time, that took a little time, at least an hour, hour and a half, to make sure that everybody was accounted for and then to verify who the subject was as he was identified in our press release and also possible clothing and route of travel and other resources. Uh, by that time, we involved the U.S. Marshals also. And last night at 1.37, uh, the subject turned himself back in to YSC. Uh, we had a heavy police presence, some collaborations with some federal agencies uh, to make sure that we could capture him safely. And then he was booked back into MDC, not YSC. Uh, the question is, why wasn't he here originally, or why was he here originally and not at MDC because he was 19 years old? I've said numerous times, and I'm asking for help from our state lawmakers. If you look in Chapter 8 in the Children's Code, it specifically says, that not only will the center have written policies, but by the only means of him turning 18, can he book, be booked, he or she, into MDC. This is a huge gap. It's antiquated. This is something that needs to be updated immediately. I will be speaking to the governor's office this week. I'm letting them know here with, through your channels to see if we can have a special order or something so this does not happen again. He was booked into MDC because he committed another crime outside of the presence and another felony after he was convicted. Therefore, we can book him as an adult. That is a huge problem for the community and it is not safe for the community at all. I'm looking at two to three things within the Children's Code to change something immediately during the special session, if not the 60 day session, uh, but it can't fall on deaf ears anymore. Uh, after the December 25th incident here, I told everybody, I warned you. And here we are, I warned you. And we are very lucky that nobody else doing this incident uh, was hurt, um, that nobody else was injured, and that no staff here at YSC was injured also. Let me make it very clear, and I will let Deputy County Manager Greg Pettis answer some other specific questions you might have. The Bernalillo County Sheriff's Office is not responsible or does not run the Youth Services Center. We respond to calls here and we respond to emergency. One thing we will do is I'm always someone to look for solutions and we'll move forward. And uh, Deputy County Manager and I met last night. One of the first things that we'll implement is our technology that we're introducing to keep an eye. And we noticed some failures here last night at the facility. I will be very upfront and very frank and I will support the Deputy County Manager on this. There needs to be a third party entity to look over YSC to make sure that it keeps the community safe. It keeps people detained correctly. There are some facts that are under investigation that I cannot reveal to you, but it does have me worried. And Deputy County Manager Pettis does need support and he does need finances to make sure that this incident does not happen again. On that note, my personal opinion is this should be a facility, but not a long-term facility. Many don't know this is a facility for people to be held here for 90 days. This individual has been here for two years. We need a different facility to separate 18 and 19 year old people if they do not choose to fix the children's code and not separate them from the other residents that are of younger age from here 
so this incident does not happen again. There's other, not just technology, but mechanisms that need to be fixed here, that need to be overlooked here. We have a lot and more work to do. I will not guarantee that this will be fixed tonight or tomorrow, but we're looking at some very short-term solutions to make sure this doesn't happen again. And if it does, that we respond much quicker, and that's something that we are working on now. Any questions? Um, sorry, when he got out yesterday, I know you said that he was, there was a possibility that he was dangerous. Did he by any chance have any weapons or arms or, you know, was there a reason to believe that maybe he was dangerous? Uh, he always, if anybody that's convicted of murder is always, uh, we don't assume he is dangerous. Uh, he had, was convicted of a double homicide, robbery and many other charges, and he has a history. Uh, did he escape here with any weapons? We don't know for sure. We're investigating um, how he got out, uh, what mechanism he used to even manipulate a door. Uh, was he armed and dangerous or did he arm himself before he turned himself back in? We don't know. Uh, we'll still have to conduct that investigation and interview him. All I know is he is a dangerous individual. If you notice on our press release, we didn't put armed and dangerous. Uh, we just want people not to approach him to call 911 so we could track him down. Uh, Sheriff, can you talk a little bit more about where he was found and the details surrounding his uh, self Yeah, The details, you can turn right around back here and that's where he walked back and turned himself back in and deputies took him into custody. Uh, YSC didn't allow him in right away because we didn't know if he was armed at all. Um, I won't get into the details of that. I mean, we had a heavy police presence around here. You might have seen avenues, streets, areas were being cut off. I know that he was tired. He ran out of resources. And again, the biggest uh, success that we have out of this uh, catastrophe is that nobody else was hurt. Sheriff, did he announce that he was going to publicly turn himself in or did he just turn up here? No, he just turned up here uh, on his own, didn't announce it to anybody. Uh, maybe coming up the investigation if he had any contact with any other, other individuals outside of the facility. That's something that we will definitely be looking into. And I know you're talking about the age gap of suspects being here. Are there any others besides him that are also here within that same weird? Yes, yes. And I'm going to be completely upfront. That needs to stop. This is dumb. Let's be upfront with it. Uh, this is dumb. It's dangerous. I don't know how many times I have to tell people the children's code needs to be updated. I warned people after Christmas. We're still here. We're here again. Hopefully something that doesn't happen. At least look at two or three things in the children's code to look at solutions. I'm not going to throw people under the bus. Um, you guys can all do that. That's your job to fill in the gaps and what, I've, what I'm saying. Um, but that's something that we need to come together and figure out very quickly. Uh, I will tell you, I had a question last night at another event and someone was blaming a lawmaker. Yes, they make the law make, they make the laws. This is something I'm specifically asking all of them to look at today. Chapter 8, it's right in front of you. 8.14.14.18. And you can go down the list on what you can you can't do. It's antiquated and it needs to be adjusted. And if we had this adjustment, this would not have happened last night and this subject would have been an MDC. I'm sure if you said there were two or three other things that you were also looking to change in the children's code, can you specify some of those other things that you would want to change? Well, I'm saying two or three things to keep it positive. I want to change the whole children's code, honestly. It needs to be updated. Um, but a couple of things is, uh, for one, as I go through my list here, juvenile should not be transferred to a county audit jail solely on the basis of turning 18 years old while in a juvenile detention center. What that means is, as he's awaiting, he or she is awaiting trial, he has been here for two years awaiting trial. He was just convicted. Now we are adding another month on June 26 when he was supposed to see the judge for him to be convicted. That's one. The second is a lot of the use of force that we deal with with children. A lot of people are forgetting that the employees that work here at YSC, we are actually setting them up for failure. They can't do certain things going hands on with juveniles. The juveniles know this. I have numerous videos showing that the juveniles know this and how these individuals and employees are attacked I won't say a daily, but on a weekly basis, and they're not safe. We're setting them up for failure. This is the second incident within six to seven months to where, once again, we are lucky where YSC individuals and employees were not hurt. Any other questions? I know it's early in the investigation, but do you know if he had any help from anyone or he was acting alone? Um, I will tell you uh, within the facility and other inmates, yes, he did have help. 
We're investigating everything else, every other at avenue, anything else that we seem that could be nefarious in nature at all, anything that we're concerned about or need to adjust and fix protocol, uh, we're going to do that immediately. On the outside, we don't know. Uh, the investigation is early. Hopefully we find those uh, facts out um, and we stop them and then we fix a lot of the issues and protocols that are the problem with this facility. Any idea where he went throughout the, the day? No, uh, we, I don't. I, I'm not going to assume on that. I, I guarantee you he just got tired and, and saw where all the law enforcement presence was um, and pretty much gave up and turned himself back here. That's something where I always discuss bottom line solutions and bottom line feelings. I'm just glad no one was hurt and he decided to do the right thing and turn himself back in. And that could be for a myriad of reasons. I don't know what they were. All I know is he's back in custody, but he's back in custody into the correct facility where he should be. Anything else? Go sure, ahead. sure. If you have other other mass murderers that are in here that committed murders like uh, Nehemiah Griego and Joseph Tony, convicted as juveniles, but they're still in this building, who ultimately is going to be responsible for transferring them into an actual jail instead of mixing them in with juveniles? Uh, lawmakers. That's the children's code. And I will tell you, instead of just calling them out, I always work with everybody and make sure that we have a solution. Um, we need to have some very tough discussions starting immediately. I don't need to wait till July or August. I need to worry about this place tonight and this evening. Um, we have other people, and I told you back in December that people assimilate to prison culture, and I saw that on video last night. Uh, 18 and 19 year olds, even if they were convicted as a juvenile and they're still being held there, which they shouldn't be, because this is only a 90 day facility, they should be transferred into an alternate facility to where they're not influencing the younger children to assimilate to a prison culture and also to make sure that it is not only better staff, but that it has better technology, has better ways of keeping them inside and better protocols, something that's meant for people that are violent in nature. I'm all about helping kids, but someone like last night that murdered people was convicted of it. They're in a criminal justice system. Uh, that's their problem. They'll have to figure it out. It's all the other people we can divert earlier and why they should be here on a 90 days to make sure that they succeed in our community. Um, do you know if YSC has upped anything or changed anything since last night that they're going to be starting today or is BS, you know, are you guys going to be also doing stuff here? I'll hand it over to De uh, Deputy County Manager Greg Pettis. I will just tell you to, um, you saw last week and we'll address the elephant in the room. I called him out last week along with DA Bregman. I do that for a reason, uh, but the whole point is you see him standing to the left of me. We work together in solution. There's no reason to cause a rift. Our whole community, including his family, is worried about their safety, worried about juveniles, worried about crime in Albuquerque. So we work together. Yes, we'll have disagreements, but that doesn't mean we stop talking. Uh, that's one of the failures of what we do here in this country when we don't get anything done. So I'll let uh, Deputy County Manager Greg Pettis speak on the improvements. Thank you, Sheriff and media who gathered. So we definitely value the relationship we share with our law enforcement partner and the sheriff specifically. Our men and women are doing a great job within the four walls of this facility. We've come a long way since the uh, issue that occurred on December 25th. This was another area where we had some amount of lapse. Um, you can attribute that to a multitude of things. One being a uh, very inexperienced uh, staff. We have increased our staff by about 50 individuals in the last three months. So with that comes training, uh, comes overall experience. So we're continuing to grow on that. We're continuing to enhance our security measures um, within the facility. This is an old facility. It's an older facility, 1970s or so. Um, so there are things within it that we haven't yet gotten to update. Um, door locks in the patios apparently being one of those those areas. Um, it's, it's a tough position for our staff to be in. Um, we're pressured to get individuals out and programmed and into you know some sunlight and such and we do things like that and then sometimes this is kind of one of the outcomes we've struggled with allowing individuals into our back ball field as well and having contraband you know brought across so we're making changes there as well to just try to tighten up the overall security of the facility you have to remember that this facility was not intended to house 27 to 29 individuals convicted of some type of murder or homicide. Right now we have 54 youth in this facility, 27 of which are in here for some form of murder or homicide. So uh, the, the environment has changed drastically in the last five years. We have a crisis amongst our youth in the community um, and locking them up isn't gonna be the way to fix it. But when we do lock them up, we have to make sure that we do so safely and securely and we are doing everything we can to make sure that that happens in this facility. I will note that this is the first type of escape as this in over 25 years in this facility. So that, that does go somewhere, but it doesn't mean that 
you know, we, we turn a blind eye to this and we have to make the right corrections to this. I'm absolutely in, in favor and in support of the Sheriff's March to make changes to the Children's Code. We need to have the tools uh, to be able to deal with the individuals who come into our, our facility. We're dealing with a lot more violent culture than we did even five years ago. This isn't the kid who is arrested for stealing bubble gum or taking his mom or dad's car for a joyride. This individual who took off last night had two, two murders under his belt and was sentenced, we were, we were, was convicted. We were waiting for sentencing. That is where we're finding our biggest problem is once the individual finds out that, hey, I'm in here for, for murder, they know that they're facing 20 plus years. They don't give a care in the world of what happens next. Um, and that's where we really need to look at how do we get those individuals out? Once they're convicted of their crime and they're just awaiting sentencing, that can be up to six months that we're waiting for that. We need to get them somewhere else, if it's MDC, if it's another facility, whatever that is, but those are the individuals that are causing us the biggest problem within the four walls because they have no care anymore. They know they're gonna spend 20 plus years um, and doing something here, assaulting one of our, our officers in the facility or escaping, those kind of things, they, they just don't care anymore. And that's been one of probably our biggest challenges. One of the highlights that I will say, I'm, I'm hopeful and I always look at things on the, on the good side that part of why our individual last night decided to turn himself back in is the hard work and dedication of our staff. They do everything they can to help to rehabilitate these individuals. And some of them, these are the only um, role models that they have to look up to. So my hope is that as he thought about taking off and bolting to a different location, his conscience got the best of him and he heard the words of some of our staff to say, you know, do the right thing, do the right thing. He just graduated out of our facility um, with his diploma last week. He was one of the three that we graduated through APS. So again, trying to find the positive in what could have been an absolutely horrible um, outcome. So thank you to the sheriff and other, other partners who helped to make sure that this ended the way that it did. I stand for any questions. I know that was long-winded. You mentioned you have 54 um, people detained here right now. Is that nice? So the max capacity of the building, physical capacity, is 78. We have 78 beds in this facility. Right now we use an 8 to 1 ratio that is established by CYFD within the Children's Code. Um, that 8 to 1 ratio would allow us to bring in up to 65 as it sits right now today. We're still 22 positions short of our max amount of positions, which is about 87. Um, and we are doing another rapid hire event uh, June 8th in the hopes to get you know, closer to 100%. Uh, capacity with staff within the within the four walls of the facility. You mentioned that uh, this place has been here since the 70s. I think the system's been broken here since the 70s because it seems like officers and deputies will sit in that sally port for like an hour, two hours sometimes before they even get in the building. Then they get in, they're there another two hours for them to immediately be released. What what What's broken there? So that, that's part of what uh, was the, the case last week or week before uh, when the sheriff and DA did send the letter to me directly. Um, we, we did have some faults in our intake process. Um, part of what has to happen is a medical clearance. We can't bring an individual into this facility who is not medically um, stable to come in. Um, they could be under the influence of alcohol, drugs, whatever it may be. We have to send them out to make sure that they're cleared by a hospital before we bring them in. And a lot of it comes down to staffing. Now that our staffing levels have come up, we are wor working to put a permanent individual in the intake area to alleviate that time. We hear loud and clear that keeping a deputy or officer here for even an hour is probably longer than any of us want to have. And we are doing everything in our power to try to make that better. Um, now that we are fully, almost fully staffed and our nurses are, are up to staff as well. So we're always looking for ways to overcome that and I think we're getting better and better each day. You mentioned new staff and a little bit inexperienced may have played a role in yesterday's incident. Do you want to talk about the training that staff receives? Yep, so we have a six-week academy that we run um, within our facility. They come into the, the, into the facility and out um, to experience different things in each of the units. Um, it really comes down to this job is really detail oriented. Uh, individuals really have got to pay very close attention, just like having a three year old at home. I mean, you take your eyes off for two seconds and something, something bad can happen. And that's no different in this facility. And I really am thinking that that's probably part of what led to last night is inattention to detail. We have placed two employees on administrative leave, which is protocol for us until we are able to do a, an internal administrative investigation in partnership with the sheriff's investigation. So really it comes down to attention to detail. And sometimes that's not something that you can teach. And we find that out, and, and sometimes it's once they've actually gotten into the facility and we start to weed them out. So we, are, we do have a full six-week academy, though, um, and hopefully we get more individuals in here soon.
Yep. And my apologies if you already mentioned it, but I think somebody said that a lock was was broken. Like, can you explain? Was he in like in a room? Was he in an outside area? And has that happened before with locks being broken? So again, a lot of this is still under investigation. He was out in a patio area. We've just started to utilize our patios again. Um, after some time of not using them to try to get individuals out. And again, now that we've got the staff to be able to do that uh, safely, um, I can't answer whether that lock had been tampered with prior or any of that. That'll come down to what the final investigation finds. Um, but on the preliminary, it looks like he was able to, to work that lock with some sort of device. Not sure exactly what that is as of yet. I will tell you that all of the locks within the facility in the patios have been checked and double checked and triple checked um, as of last night's event. What is your plan for the 27 other um, murder convicts that are here right now in light of everything that happened? So our plan is to continue business as usual, um, continue to provide for them, to provide for their mental well-being, physical well-being, spiritual well-being, if that's what they're looking for. Um, it doesn't matter what they're in here for. They're in our charge, they're in our care, and we have to do everything that we can to protect them, and we will continue to do that going forward. We will continue to uh, go back to basics with all of our staff in making sure that they're following all of the policies and procedures and protocols. We've put a lot of them out in the last six months, so uh, just going back and refreshing that with them and making sure that they are where they need to be to allow us to continue to operate this facility safely. I do want to I do want to put it out there that this facility is not in jeopardy of having big issues happening in it. We're strong. We're in a good place right now. Um, it can happen anywhere. It can happen in any corrections facility. That's one of the risks of running a corrections facility. But we're confident right now that we're in a good place within our within our four walls. Um, and I, I leave it at that. I'll answer to clarify on in reference to your question to add on to that. The 27 individuals, uh, as the sheriff, they don't need to be here. They're in here for murder. They're in here for high uh, violent crimes. They need to be in another facility. Uh, that is a corrections facility and to where they do have resources, but they need to be away from the other kids who've committed a crime that are trying to get back into our community safely. So I'm not going to soft foot around that. That's something that needs to change within the children's code. When something like what occurred yesterday happens, you know, you analyze everything that led up to it, how long does it take to implement those changes to make it more secure? We were implementing changes real time last night as we saw them. So. Um, real time. I mean, if we see something that is glaring at us that maybe we had missed, we change it immediately. The sheriff kind of mentioned the timeline and that gap of time span before PTSO was notified. Um, can you kind of share from your perspective what may have led to that big time gap? So that's difficult to do being that it's still under investigation. Um, we are looking at that time frame, as I said. Um, we did put two individuals that were overseeing that pot on administrative leave. So I don't want to get too deep into that out of respect for them. Um, but a, a, again, there were a multitude of things that led up to that, that we have already gone back in and corrected. One of them being our counts, making sure that we are going around in the facility and doing our counts more regularly and a more consistent and concise pass down from shift to shift. Um, those are the things that we addressed immediately last night uh, within the facility. So you mentioned you're about to be fully staffed, which means you've probably been understaffed for a while. How would you say the officer's uh, morale is that are actually working here and have been working here for a while? So I would say that the morale has come up quite a bit. Um, of course, things like this, any kind of negative publicity that or, or press that happens out there makes them question what they're doing. Um, negative interactions within the, in the facility with youth obviously is going to make you question you coming in. But our staff does a great job to appreciate and respect the work that, that our men and women do within the facility. The county does its best to, to help uh, in that area financially. Um, we've got a great group of individuals inside and we've done a great job of maintaining the staff that we've hired in the course of the last three months. So that's a, that tells me that things are going right inside the facility as far as morale um, and the employees themselves. We've just got to continue on that, on that pace and, and not let up because ultimately our staff is everything. If we lose staff, we lose the ability to help our law enforcement partners, and then we're back into having to turn people away. And right now, we're really trying our best not to turn anyone away who comes to uh, the Sally Port to be booked. That's, that's what I have worked together with the sheriff and DA Bregman on last week, that we're gonna do everything in our power to not turn anybody away, but staff is key to, to all of that. One more question. Mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned the 
So as of the events that happened on December 25th, we have started to separate folks out as best we can. Um, that's difficult sometimes because there's a lot of familiar relationships within here. Some of the individuals who are in for those higher, higher level crimes are friends or know the others that are there. So you gotta be very careful that you don't put you know, certain individuals together. Um, and it, it's a balancing act that our staff does a really, really good job with. Um, and that's the best I can give you on that one. We don't have them segregated by any means. We've looked at that maybe as, a, as an option down the road um, as we continue to get our staff up and we get the children's code changed. You have to remember that you could all walk into this facility right now and that's all that you would be given is what you have on your body to be able to defend yourself in the event something went wrong inside of that facility. These kids are big, these kids are strong, um, and we are, we are definitely at a disadvantage. All we have is numbers, um, but we, we do not carry any type of, of anything on our person uh, within the facility. So that gives you some insight where at a corrections facility such or a detention as MDC, they're fully equipped with belts similar to what, what law enforcement wears uh, and for good reason. And we're not asking for all of that, but we do have to do something more to equip our individuals to really show who's in charge within the four walls. Thank you. Yep.